Hi everyone, welcome back. Like I said last time, I'd like to begin today's lecture by examining a few lines from Ben Jonson's Ode to Shakespeare, which I asked you to read last week. It's a very flattering poem uh, from sh uh, to Shakespeare, uh, which might strike us as surprising given that Ben Jonson and Shakespeare were rivals throughout their careers. Uh, ben Jonson was a playwright and a poet, uh, probably most known for his plays Every Man in His Humor and The Alchemist. Unlike Shakespeare, he was classically educated and went to school at Cambridge, and he would often make quips about how Shakespeare's work uh, wasn't any good. Uh, even in this ode that, we, that we've read, uh, there's a reference to Shakespeare's knowing small Latin and less Greek. And this isn't unique to Johnson. In fact, many of Shakespeare's contemporaries who had college educations resented his intrusion into their profession. They thought of him as this sort of country bumpkin amateur. But Ben Johnson, uh, despite all of this, does seem to have been friends with Shakespeare. And the ode shows us that he was willing to give credit where credit was due. So his jokes about Shakespeare's lack of an education are probably good natured. Uh, just him taking shots at his buddy. And we know that Shakespeare actually acted in some of Johnson's plays too. Uh, so while there was competition between them, it was likely a friendly sort of competition. So in the ode, uh, Johnson talks about how really uh, there's no need to build a monument to Shakespeare in the way that monuments have been built to the other great poets of the past. And the reason for this is because Shakespeare still lives uh, through his work. He says, Soul of the age, the applause, delight, the wonder of our stage, my Shakespeare, rise. I will not lodge thee by Chaucer or Spencer, or bid Beaumont lie a little further to make thee a room. Thou art a monument without a tomb, and art alive still while, they, while thy book doth live, and we have wits to read and praise to give. So, um, this actually echoes a lot of what Shakespeare says himself about uh, the magic of verse or the magic of writing uh, in his sonnets. Uh, he says there that it immortalizes the subject or the speaker so that they're presented fresh and new to each su succeeding generation. So, uh, Johnson's probably picking up on this idea here too. Uh, he says a little bit further down, that he was not of an age, Shakespeare wasn't, but for all time, and all the muses still were in their prime, when like Apollo he came forth to warm our ears, or like a Mercury to charm. I'd like to uh, point your attention to the seeming contradiction that Johnson's making here, um, where earlier he calls Shakespeare the soul of the age, that is, of Elizabethan England. But then... Down here, he's not of any age, uh, but for all time. But rather than contradicting himself, Johnson is saying that Shakespeare is, paradoxically, both. And I think that that's a good key towards how we should approach reading him as well. Uh, that he's not just the soul of his own age, but he's uh, the soul of our age as well. The soul of every age. Or maybe instead of soul, uh, he's the... The, the inspiring muse it might be a better way of thinking of it. I mentioned in last, last week's lecture uh, that we would consider the historical context in which Shakespeare was writing his plays, as well as the historical context behind the events which the plays portray. Uh, and yeah, uh, that first thing, we should keep in mind that Shakespeare was the soul of his age, tapping into the passions and fears and beliefs of his fellow Londoners, but now, as we approach his plays, there's a third context in which I'd ask you to consider him, and that's in our own context. A professor of mine used to be fond of saying that Shakespeare has something to say to each generation that reads him, and I think that in a lot of ways that's true. When we read his plays, uh, we'll see things that remind us of our own political and cultural problems. We'll see that history repeats itself uh, really in fascinating ways. And I think that that's another advantage that you'll gain from this class. Uh, the, issue that we'll, uh, the issues that we'll address 
and the struggles uh, that some of these characters go through are still relevant today, uh, despite having happened in the 15th century. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted you to read that ode by Johnson, because it really highlights uh, that Shakespeare has this universal appeal, uh, that he's not just relevant to his own age, although he certainly was, but he's relevant to ours too. So with that idea of reading with a sort of threefold lens in mind, uh, let's turn to the plays. The eight plays from Richard II to Richard III uh, can be read as one continuous story. Historically, the events that they cover span from the year 1399 to the year 1485, so in other words, 86 years. Uh, but to get a better understanding of the story, we have to go back even further in time, and that's what I want to do in this week's lecture. That way, when we start reading Richard III, uh, you'll be caught up on what's been happening in the past and what many of the characters in the play are making references to. So, the drama of Shakespeare's eight plays and the dynastic struggles that take place within them really begins with King Edward III, who reigned from 1327 to 1377. Uh, he's a king who was widely regarded as a stabilizing figure. Uh, his father hadn't been a very good king, and he was able to bring back dignity and honor to the throne and to the country. He also reigned for a long time, uh, for the Middle Ages at least, uh, for 50 years, which is always helpful when it comes to keeping things orderly and well-maintained. Although he's already dead, he's actually been long dead by the time Richard II begins, his role is still extremely important, and he's far from absent in the story. In the play, he's universally acknowledged as a great king, and as a war hero. His reign, as we'll see, really exemplifies the golden age or the good old days to both the older characters in the play who knew him and uh, to the younger characters who have grown up hearing stories about him and about his reign. In a way, it's similar to how people who figured in the American Revolution are somehow romanticized today. Uh, when we think of George Washington or Thomas Jefferson, they loom in our imaginations as these sort of larger-than-life figures. But really, they were just men, you know, like the rest of us, subject to the same fears, needs, and corruptions that we are. But a myth has grown up around them and the men of their time. Uh, they're the founding fathers, again, larger than life uh, figures. A more modern example of this uh, might be how we view the generation that endured the Great Depression and fought in World War II today. Uh, we call them, actually, the greatest generation and often draw comparisons between those in our day and age to them, and those comparisons are usually to our own detriment. And that's not to say that the reputation isn't well-deserved, either, right? In fact, it's because it's well-deserved that we tend to view those of that generation and of the American Revolution as larger than life. And we'll see that the characters in Richard II look on the generation of Edward III's time in a similar way. For our purposes, and this is definitely a simplification, but I think it's one that works thematically, uh, we can think of Edward III's reign as standing for our conception of medieval times in a nutshell. So you have chivalrous knights, uh, God-ordained kings, jousting tournaments, and great battles, etc. You know, really, it's the world that we see in the stained glass windows or in old manuscript paintings. And we'll see in Richard II how many of the characters long for a return to this world, and how others, like Richard himself, are under the delusion that they still live in that world, even though, as is evident from the plays, times have already begun to change. A contemporary chronicle, chronicler, uh, Jean Froissart, uh, writing during that same period, he said that in his own lifetime, he had seen the decline of honorable enterprises, noble adventures, and deeds of arms. So the sense of a loss having occurred uh, was really prevalent uh, during this period. And this was right after the, the bubonic plague as well. Uh, so there are, certainly were people who in their own lifetime had seen uh, not just a political decline, but a physical decline. They'd seen uh, the plague ravish the countryside and they were just now starting to come out of it. So Edward III had seven sons, 
and it's the descendants of these sons around which the plays we'll be reading revolve. As I've said before, uh, they really can all be read as one great family drama, these plays, although each is a wonderful read in its own right as well. Now, historically, Edward III had daughters too, and occasionally one of them will be mentioned, but they don't figure too much in the events that Shakespeare portrays in his writings. Uh, that's not to say they weren't important. Uh, one of them became a duchess, another uh, was a countess. Uh, but when we look at this family tree uh, that you're about to see and talk about who's descended from who and lines of succession, I've left the daughters out for the sake of simplicity. Uh, so with that caveat in mind, Here's what Edward III's family tree looks like. Now, the order of royal succession states that when the king dies, his oldest son gets the throne. However, you'll see the first son there, Edward the Black Prince, died before his father, so he never got to be king. There are a lot of stories we could say about him too, by the way. Uh, his life was varied and exciting enough for a play to have been written about him as well, and they have been, though Shakespeare never wrote one. He actually earned himself a reputation almost equal to his father's. He participated in the first wave of battles between England and France that came to be known as the Hundred Years' War, and was a successful and decorated knight and commander. So it was a great loss, not only to his father Edward, but to the country as well when he died young. Uh, he died of dysentery. Before he died, though, he did have a son, Richard. So when Edward III died, shortly after the Black Prince, Richard was crowned King Richard II as a child, only 10 years old. Now today we call people the first of their name or the second of their name or so on if our parents had the same name as us, but that's not quite how it worked in medieval England. Uh, Richard was called Richard II because he was the second king of England to have that name, just as Edward III was the third king of England to have his name. And while we're on the topic of titles, you can see that almost all of Edward's sons had at least one title. Some of them have more than one. This can be confusing at times, but it can also be helpful because a lot of these characters have the same first name, and the titles help to differentiate them, especially in a play like uh, Henry IV Part I, where it seems like everyone and their dog is named Henry. So, some of these sons of Edward III, uh, like William of Hatfield or William of Windsor, are simply called by the place where they were born. Uh, sometimes that place will be used as a surname, and other times it will be used as a person's only name. Uh, in Richard II, John of Gaunt's son, Henry, is called Bolingbroke, uh, because he was born at a place called Bolingbroke. Uh, other times he'll be called Hereford, because he's also the Duke of Hereford, so that's one of his titles. Some characters who are earls or dukes, such as Edmund, Duke of York, will simply go by that title instead. And so keep in mind titles and names. Come up with a list of them if it helps you so you don't get uh, people confused because it can be a little uh, confusing. So by the start of Richard II, many of the people on this family tree are already dead. Edward III is dead, Edward the Black Prince is dead, and several others are gone as well either slain in battle or, like William of Hatfield, died in infancy. So, as the play begins, the family tree looks roughly like this. Only two of Edward III's seven sons still survive, John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster, and the Duke of York. One of the other sons, the Duke of Gloucester, has just died recently, and his death will be discussed in the opening act of the play. Now, the real conflict in Richard II is between King Richard and his cousin, Henry Bolingbroke. And to prepare you for next week's reading, I want to say a word about the relationship between the two of them now. Richard is a man who, as I've said, became king at a young age. Now, during his first few years as king, the responsibility of ruling the kingdom would have been on different advisors and family members. Uh, nobody ever let a 10-year-old decide what the plan was going to be. But also, as you can imagine, he would have grown up rather spoiled. Uh, nobody would really want to tell the king no, either. And because of this, he's grown up being led around by advisors and flatterers, and this has led him to think that he's something more than human, that he's somehow untouchable. 
He embodies a belief which was prominent in the Middle Ages and became even more prominent in the 17th century under Louis XIV uh, that in France that the king was God's chosen deputy or representative on earth uh, to rule and judge things as God Almighty would do. This isn't actually an idea that's unique to Christianity either. Uh, the, the idea of the king having a divine ordinance from God to rule uh, and being answerable to nobody but God goes back even further than Christianity itself. In fact, some ancient cultures, uh, in some ancient cultures, the king was perceived to be a god in human flesh, uh, such as in, Egypt in Egyptian mythology and in Mesopotamian uh, literature. Uh, the Romans believed that when their emperor died, uh, they became gods. In China, the emperor was considered to have received a mandate from heaven to rule, and he was referred to as the son of heaven. And in the Middle Ages, the idea was prevalent that the king was destined to rule before his birth by God, and that he didn't have to listen to his nobles, uh, to parliament, or to whoever else would interfere uh, or would want to interfere with his will. Now, this is an interesting uh concept to think about because the Bible itself doesn't authorize tyranny or demand unquestioning loyalty from a king's subjects. Uh, it certainly does state that a king only rules if God wants him to rule uh, and also that the subjects should be good citizens. But remember the famous episode where the Pharisees tried to uh, trick Jesus into saying that the Jews shouldn't pay their taxes to Rome uh, and they try to do this so that they can accuse him of sedition and instead Jesus says, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Meaning Caesar's face is on the coin, so it's his, uh, so pay your taxes. Uh, but there's also instances in the Bible where subjects rebel against bad rulers who are abusing their authority, and are rewarded for it. Uh, when Pharaoh orders the midwives to kill the sons of the Hebrew women when they're born, uh, the midwives lie. Uh, they directly go against his orders. They say that the Hebrew women were so fast at giving birth that the babies were born before they could even get to the house. And God doesn't punish them for deceiving Pharaoh. He blesses them for it. He establishes them uh, for them households, in the, the book of Exodus says. Or consider Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the episode with the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has given them an order uh, to worship this idol that he's made. All the other Babylonians, the good citizens, are doing it. And in, if an earthly ruler really has an unqualified right to obedience, uh, then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego should just do as they're told. But of course they don't, uh, because they're obeying God's dictates, not man's. Going back to that, rendering unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and unto God the things that are God's, sure, there are some things in which the earthly ruler has some say, uh, but when it comes to matters of conscience, when it comes to matters of religion, following one's own, uh, following one's own beliefs, uh, we render unto God the things that are God's. So just because God ordains who becomes king or ruler doesn't mean that they have free reign to do whatever they want. Uh, all throughout the Old Testament, we see the kings of Judah and Israel uh, become corrupt, and then God brings them to a horrible end, uh, a horrible but a justified end. But anyway, uh, Richard uh, thinks that he has divine permission to rule according to his own whims. What this play we'll be reading is really about is Richard rediscovering his own humanity, uh, his own flaws that come with being a mere mortal just like everybody else. You'll see that at the start of the play, he's a really unlikable character who frequently compares himself to God, uh, but he comes more sympathetic as he slowly starts to regain his humanity. And this is a trait that he shares with many other of Shakespeare's tragic heroes. But even as this transformation occurs, he's been so indoctrinated in the belief that he is some uh, superhuman figure that he still can't help but draw comparisons between himself and Jesus Christ throughout. He does this a lot, uh, and you'll notice uh, that he's always making these comparisons and that they're always a bit far-fetched. Uh, Jesus Christ never murdered or stole uh, and we'll see that Richard did both. And he faced his persecution and crucifixion in relative silence, while Richard can't stop talking about himself and how miserable he is the whole time. Not only is he a talker, he's also a bit of a poet. 
He speaks in a flowery, elegant style, and he has an eye for theatrics. Uh, critics who study this play note that he always manages to put himself center stage, both metaphorically and physically. And this contrasts him with his cousin, Henry Bullingbrook, who is Richard's opposite in a lot of ways. Henry doesn't like the spotlight. He's a taciturn, quiet, uh, and kind of shadowy individual, and he sort of lets things play out around him instead of acting as a driving force as Richard does. Because of this, it's hard to know what to think of him, although we get glimpses of both good and bad aspects of his personality throughout. But he certainly plays things close to the chest, so it's hard to know what he's thinking. If, we're, if we want to think about Richard as an actor or as a poet, then Henry is a politician. Uh, again, if Richard speaks the language of poetry, Henry, when he speaks at all, speaks prose. Now, you can probably guess from the title of the next two plays, uh, and from the fact that this play is a tragedy of sorts, that Henry ultimately triumphs over Richard. And at the same time, this signals the triumph of the real world, uh, the world of politicians and plots and pragmatic characters, over the world that Richard sees himself as belonging to. Uh, Edward III's world, uh, with its heroes and chivalry and divine right to rule. And that's certainly a theme that I'd like you to pay attention to as you read here. Uh, it's one that Shakespeare develops not only in this play, but on into the two parts of Henry IV and into Henry V as well, uh, where we'll see that, for a moment at least, these two worlds are brought back together. Uh, but it's typically a conflict between the two of them that we're seeing. So, for the next lecture, read Act 1 of Richard II. Uh, keep in mind what I said last time about reading aloud. Uh, sometimes the language makes sense audibly where it doesn't in print. Uh, why is this the case? It's hard to say, but it's the sort of writer that Shakespeare was, uh, that he could achieve that effect. So, that'll be it, and I'll see you all in the next lecture.